Dr. Johnny Oxendine speaking on uh, hermeneutics, the, the uh, uh, new hermeneutic and unity. Uh, Johnny was born in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, and graduated from the North Carolina system and baptized Christ in 1977. He's a uh, member of the San Mateo congregation. Actually, he preaches there, full-time preacher there. Been 12 years now. And he married the former Pamela Hackworth, and that's uh, Noah Hackworth's daughter. His two children, Leslie, she's in college, and Andrew is still in high school. And he's uh, spoken at various uh, lectureships in Texas, Nevada, and California. And of course, he uh, has uh, been published in various uh, Brotherhood papers. And certainly, uh, I've known Johnny for, uh, well, at least the year 2000. <laughs> That's when we took our son, Keith, out to California to, to go to school. And Keith has been a member there at San Mateo since that time. And I think because of that, Keith has become um, more uh, skilled in service to the Lord. And Johnny's been a great help to him, and I, and I think Keith has been a great help to Johnny. Uh, San Mateo is not dissimilar to Spring, that it exists in a uh, sea of liberalism. So that uh, kind of hones your talents when you have to defend yourself and stand for the truth in situations like that. So I'm uh, greatly pleased to uh, uh, have Johnny here today. And, and I consider him a true friend, and I think that the topic that he has for us today is certainly a, a timely topic, and one that will have a great uh, benefit, be great benefit to us. So, Johnny, would you come speak to us? Most of the time when someone finds out that I'm from the San Francisco area, they, they ask, uh, uh, how are the fruits and nuts? <laughs> and I, I just say each year we have a few more fruits and a few more nuts. And this morning I was telling Ken that usually by the time everyone's ready to discard their fruits and nuts, they, then that's when they know they're ready to come out of California. The last time I was here, I'm not sure if it was our mayor of San Francisco, but uh, the latest, greatest news is actually has to do with the California congregation and has to do a little bit with the topic that I have this morning on hermeneutics. And of course, the discussion of new hermeneutics is really a discussion about the authority of the scriptures. And it is basically an attempt to disregard that authority of the scriptures. And so in the last year, a congregation not far from us, who on their website says that, of course, they believe that the Bible is the word of God, but they reserve the right to interpret it uh, in the way that is best suited to them and uh, the Stanford area that they're trying to cater to. And so in the last year, they have installed... Uh, a few ladies as elders and about three deacons. That's where we live. I think we're probably advanced in that particular state of uh, depravity above the rest of the country, at least for the most part. Uh, in First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says, For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, when you see the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The person that truly accepts Jesus as Lord will carefully obey his will, and he will do it as it is revealed in his word. 
the teaching of the apostles contained for us in the New Testament is nothing less than the Lord's word, first, uh, chapter of Galatians, verses 11 and 12. And then determining what our faith and practice will be, which is essentially fellowship, it is of the utmost importance that we respect the authority of the scriptures. Now I want to thank the congregation here at Spring for inviting me. I want to thank the leadership for allowing me to come back to this wonderful place. Every time I'm here, I eat so much more than I do when I'm home. And Nancy says, are you sure you've had enough? I don't know how Ken stays as trim and fit as he is. You need breakfast. <laughs> but uh, we wanted to uh, just make those little opening comments and certainly to thank the congregation here. Uh, the theme, unity from God or man, uh, it targets the source of error uh, and also the divisions that take place in the brotherhood. Uh, God does not create confusion or division. Uh, his word is revealed and it has the purpose of bringing us together. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, in mind and spirit and in truth. And the subject that we have, new hermeneutics and unity. When we think about that, we think about the, not going to go into all that we have in the manuscript, but we'd like to touch on some points about hermeneutics, this idea of a new hermeneutic and this movement of new hermeneutics. Uh, hermeneutics itself, the science of interpretation. I know it's a, it, the word itself has a certain sound to it, but it comes from a Greek word that means to explain. It means to interpret. It means uh, something that is, is conveyed in a particular way. It, it comes from the word, uh, from the Greek messenger Hermes, and he's an interpreter to the other mythological gods. And so plainly and simply, hermeneutics, principles by which we interpret, uh, explain, or expound the scriptures. And one might think of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, and he was asked if he understood what he was reading. And he says, how can I accept someone, some man should guide me? From that point, of course, Philip preached unto him Jesus. So there is an expounding, an explanation, an interpretation uh, of the scriptures. And when we think about the rules of biblical interpretation, which of course is, is also in the realm of hermeneutics, the rules by which the Bible must be interpreted. And this is in order to ascertain what in the case of biblical hermeneutics, God's message is for us. A good example, and I think Brother Hatcher used it last night in Luke chapter 24 verse 27, that particular verse where Jesus interpreted to them all in the scriptures concerning himself. And he clarified, what he did was he clarified uh, the things that needed to be understood, the idea of expounding. And I think you can see how what we are now in this age of uh, liberalism and, and neoconservatism even, uh, the idea of hermeneutics and how this it's this variance on these understanding of the things that we find in the scriptures. Uh, even Paul, as he spoke to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when he talked about the tongues, he says, whatever, must, whatever is said must be understood. But it must be understood in the way in which God has revealed it, not in the way that we want it to sound. And so there are three basic avenues of, uh, through which we may learn what the Lord wants us to do. This idea of hermeneutics, uh, the way that we want to look at it briefly this morning. First of all, there are the direct commands. And I think every Christian understands those pretty clearly. I mean, sometimes we run into brethren that pretend they don't understand them, but they know what God is saying, a direct command. And commands are those explicit commands that we see in the Scriptures, repent and be baptized. That's a direct command. And we see the direct command actually also in, in the terms, we're going to use an example of the Lord's Supper to sort of show 
uh, all areas of the hermeneutical procedure. One, we see that it was a command by, as it was instituted by our Lord in Matthew and in Luke and as recounted uh, recount for us in 1 Corinthians by Paul. So we partake of the Lord's Supper because it was a direct command. There's also the approved apostolic example or authorized examples. Uh, and these, of course, from the scriptures, one example would be the appointment of elders by Paul and Barnabas, we see that that is an example. Uh, and so we also look at that uh, from the standpoint of the Lord's Supper. We partake uh, on the first day of the week because in the New Testament, uh, the congregations were doing that on the, the apostolic direction, Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples were gathered together to break bread, Paul discoursed or spoke with them, intending to depart on the morrow, and he preached uh, to them until midnight. That was an example. That was an event that serves as an example for us. We also see uh, the use of necessary inference. And so these letters, C-E-N-I, -E command, examples, necessary inference. Uh, necessary inference would be found in passages such as those which infer the idea of an inference, something that infers which you apply reason uh, by deduction to establish by deduction, drawing conclusions of specific cases that are found in the scriptures. Again, when we think of the first day of the week, we partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, we were commanded to do that. We saw the example of that being done, and it's every first day of the week because that is implied by the passages in the scriptures as well. Uh, again, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. One might think of 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2 with respect to the contribution. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I gave order to the churches of Galatia, he says, So also do ye upon the first day of the week, And so when we look at that and also put that together with the uh, scripture in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, we want to look at those because sometimes we look at the denomination we don't look at, but we know from the denominational world, your friends and maybe colleagues uh, in, in work or maybe even neighbors, and these people, they partake in, in the way that they understand it. They have their communions once a quarter, once a year, once a holiday, or something like that. I was even in a congregation visiting where one of the questions that came up in the class, the person was going to be out of town, wanted to know if they could take communion when they got back on Thursday. Now, in the book of Exodus, as we said, chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, there, of course, you're familiar with these verses, where uh, he says, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. And we have heard this over and over as an example of necessary that goes along with necessary inference there. He says, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. For in six days, as he gives the explanation, kind of in creation, of course, the Lord made heaven and earth to see and all that it is in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. Did not those uh, people who heard that, did they not know that God was speaking about every Sabbath? Did he have to explain to them? When he said, remember the Sabbath to keep it whole. They understood explicitly. The inference was there, the implication was there, that it was every single Sabbath. And so when we look at this topic, biblical hermeneutics, and we put it uh, aside with the idea of a new hermeneutic, and this is really a group of people, liberals, who want to find another way to look at the Bible, or they want to disregard the authority of the scriptures in order to uh, include practices, uh, such as we spoke earlier, such uh, women as elders, women as deacons, uh, and all these other things that uh, the children, the children church and everything else, uh, it's, it's like one of those stews. Anything that you want, let's just find a way to reinterpret the scriptures. Let's just find a way around the scriptures. Let's just look at the, uh, the way that we now want to, I think it was mentioned yesterday, see the scriptures not as a pattern, but as a love letter. We'll come to that. 
And this is the thing that is perhaps disheartening when we think about the, the problems that we always have to deal with on a regular basis, but this is the thing that we see with regard to the authority of the scriptures. New hermeneutics is really an attempt to circumvent the authority of the Bible. Now in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and of course we have a comparable verse in the New Testament. God said, He shall not add unto the word which I have commanded you, and neither shall you diminish aught from it. The compliment to that, or one of the many compliments to that in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, where he says, I testify, for if any man shall add unto them, God shall add unto them the plagues which are written in the book, and any man shall take away. And again, we see the importance of the authority of the Scriptures. Now, change agents, as they were called and still are to some degree, they are now disavowing these various methods of discerning God's Word. They are looking at other ways in which they can hope to do so. But they fall into two categories. When we think about the scriptures, when we think about the attitudes towards scriptural authority, it basically falls into two areas. One is that the attitude is that God's silence is permissive or that God's silence is prohibitive. Now it's one or the other. Many people follow the approach. It's, they say that if God does not say specifically, if he does not specifically forbid something, then it must be acceptable. And the other, of course, is the view that it, if God does not authorize it, then it should not be done. And that critical question is not, as some would have it, where does it say not to, but rather where is the scriptural authority for it? And I think we find ourselves in, in a sea, and surrounded, perhaps we're an island, surrounded by people who are no longer looking for the authority, but rather trying to run away from the authority. They're trying to decide on what way can I get around, what way can I get away from what the Bible actually says so that I can do what I want to do so that we can run this operation the way that we want to run it. We're not that interested anymore. This is, this is really what we find with new hermeneutics. Uh, we're not really interested in the way that God has revealed it to us, the, God, the way that God has commanded us, the way that he has explained it to us clearly through the scriptures. But how can we find this newfangled way? How can we reinvent it? Because there's a whole lot of, there are a whole lot of opportunities out there for other things, and most of it has to do with money. And we really come down to, and this is almost everything, you distill it, it there's, there's money at the bottom. And people understand money, and, and believe me, the new hermeneutical people understand money quite well. And so we look here uh, at the various other scriptures that, that one could look at. I just want to come to some examples. And again, this is, this is where it becomes crystal clear of how God has allowed us through the scriptures to understand exactly what he's saying. I want to look at these examples here in the prohibitive nature of God's silence. And I want to start with examples that are easy to understand, simple and found in everybody's Bible. The first one I want to look at is Noah. And everybody knows the story of Noah, so I'm not going to try to recount that entirely, but in, in Genesis chapter 6, verses uh, 14 through 16. And there, of course, where Noah is told what he is to use in order to build the ark. And I just want to ask that question because I'm not going to read all these verses. Now, here's the thing. I want to stop this right here because David came up and he sat beside me and he said... Uh, he gave me this time limit. And, I, and he sort of laughed, and I sort of laughed, because when David comes out to speak in San Mateo, and, and Brother Lynn Parker knows, he said, well, how long do I have to speak? I said, as long as you want. <laughs> now, of course, we understand that the format is different, and so but I just had to get that in. He really wants to hear what is but when we think about Noah and we think about the, the building of the ark, I just want to ask this question. Would there have been anything wrong with Noah building the ark out of some other kind of wood? 
Now God told him what to use. He was very specific in what to use. And, and we look down in verse 22, and, and, and I think David may have uh, said it himself or used this particular verse. It says, Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Now the scripture does not say he went over and above what God commanded or he decided to change what God commanded. It didn't say that he was going to be new hermeneutical about what God commanded. He did exactly and only what God commanded him to do. And we also look at, and, and the example is used as they made that in the Bible, we, we know that in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, these three men, they fail to, uh, these men fail to glorify God and, and treat him as holy. And how do they do this? Well, of course, we saw how they do that. And, and in the scripture there it says, which he had not commanded them. They decide to create strange fire in a way that he had not commanded. See, new hermeneutics, not that new. They had already decided that they were going to do it a different way. They were going to interpret it a different way. Jeroboam. Again, these are, I wanted to look at these examples that are, that are certainly memorable and that, the, and that the, the kids know about as well. Was there anything wrong with what he had devised in his heart, First Kings? Anything wrong with that? Well, he had, he had made his own decision on how to interpret what they were going to do. He had devised in his heart. Last night someone spoke about First Kings, chapter 12, verses 32 and 33. Naaman, Second Kings. Another example. And that's, that's an example that really, really speaks quite a bit about what we see in the world today. Of course, anything wrong with dipping in some other river than, than the one uh, that God had intended, the Jordan? Anything wrong with that? He even asked that question himself. He says, well, he says, aren't there, uh, aren't there rivers better than, than all the waters of Israel? Is that not a question that we even hear today? Aren't there better ways to, to preach the gospel? Aren't there better ways to, to do uh, all these other things? Aren't there better ways to entertain people? New hermeneutics, what, are they, what does that also try to include? People who now want to have instruments in the worship. I mean, new hermeneutics is just a spin on doctrinal error, really. And that, and that idea, isn't there a better way to get people in, uh, excited about the worship, to get them involved in the worship? Uh, we have all these things going on in the background now. These little, uh, It's almost back in the 60s. You know, with the hippies and the, and the tie-dyes and everything on in the background and the, and the guitar players and the hula girls and everything else and the people just excited. Isn't there a, a better way, Naaman? Isn't there a better way? Isn't there some way to keep AP around? There's got to be a better way. I, I think what we'll do is we'll just disregard the truth. I think we can keep it around that way. We'll just, we'll just have a blind eye to error, and that'll do it. Second Chronicles tells us about a king, chapter 26. Started out pretty good, but of course he decided to exalt himself beyond that which he was able to bear. Found himself with leprosy until he died. The Bible clearly warns against presumptuous sin and new hermeneutics and the way that people attempt to interpret the Bible and to change things about the Bible. That's presumptuous sin. We see in Psalms uh, 19, verse 13, it says, Keep us from presumptuous sin. And then in 2 Peter also, chapter 2, verse 12, talks about presumptuous and self-will. And that's what these people are. Uh, the Bible is not that difficult to understand, really. I think you people already know that. It, it speaks plainly. It speaks clearly. It tells us exactly what God wants us to do. 
It's really not that hard. It's a self-willed person who does not want to obey it. It's a person who lacks humility, who is self-righteous in his own way. Those are the people who fall into the camp, who follow the lead of new hermeneutics. People who, and we'll get to this point as quickly as I can, uh, who also think of themselves as very uh, educated, very smart. Uh, but what does this do? This is one of the points we try to make in the book, the idea of unity. And it destroys, new hermeneutics destroys the, his, uh, the, the unity for which Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. When we think about Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, again, verses that we use uh, previously where he urges the brethren to speak the same thing, to be of the same mind and the same judgment. Well, you can't be of the same mind and the same judgment when new hermeneutics say that you can think whatever you please and do whatever you want. And we find that it, that it is inclusive of just about every ideology under the sun. How can, and, and this was a question that came up in the Bay Area. Uh, there was a congregation on the other side of the Bay that was uh, involved in a Bible camp. We have nothing to do with either one of these groups, but anyway. They are involved with a Bible camp with a group who now has these new women elders and deacons. And they already have their own problems. They're having Christmas parties, and uh, I'm not sure they have a tree up yet, but um, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> but it says we, it's, they said we're no longer involved with that congregation. And it's as though all of a sudden they became liberal, like all of a sudden. But when is liberalism been all of a sudden? It, it creeps in, it creeps in, it creeps in. And you can smell it. And it, it's amazing that all of a sudden, now they don't have anything to do with this group, but they, had, they were involved in this Bible camp with them for 20 years. New hermeneutics obviously creates a fellowship issue. And that's obvious. Because when there are various influential people and trends that are stirring the church, uh, in conflicting directions, it's impossible to speak the same thing, to be of the same mind and same judgment. When you're going in all these different directions, you cannot be the same. Amos 3.3. 3. You're not walking together, and so you can't be agreed. I want to also go back to John chapter, 17, uh, chapter 17. And there, of course, Jesus in his, his prayer for unity. And it talks about the importance of the word. This is where people are moving away from the Bible. The importance of the word. Rather than trying to get closer to the word, people are trying to get further away. They're trying to limit it. They're trying to, uh, they're obviously compromising it. They're trying to dissolve the importance of it. Jesus said, the words which I gave, which thou gavest me, I gave unto them. And he said in verse 21 of that chapter that we might be one. So is, is there a desire for unity? Absolutely. Jesus prayed for that. He wanted his followers, he wants us to be one. But the standard for that is his word. The only way that we can be one is if we are of the same mind and same judgment. If we interpret and if we convey the meaning of the scripture that he has given us in the same way. I can't teach one thing about baptism and, and David teach something else and, and we be agreed. Our views about sin can't, can't be different. If, if I say to someone who comes to San Mateo, uh, you know, I get, a, I get one of those little spray brushes, like, you know, a little spray thing and tell them they're baptized, go ahead, and they're okay. And, and David's over there immersing people and, and saying that this, and now you're a, you're, you're a New Testament Christian. That can't be the same. And so we, we look at this, this issue, uh, and, and these people are really not, I, I thought about it the other day, and I, I wondered whether or not they were arrogant, and I, I think it's, it's that they're idiots. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm serious because you, you have to understand that, that in order to be going in, the, in these directions, you know that you're not doing what the Bible teaches. 
And if you are consciously going in a direction that is in, in away from what God teaches, and you're supposed to be an intelligent person, then you're really not as intelligent as you think. And, and when we look at these people, and some of them, of course, they, they find themselves with PhDs, they find themselves in these universities, I'll get to universities in a minute, uh, then you, you really think that it's not arrogance, really, it's, it's idiocy. How can, you, how can you intentionally be going to perdition, as they say? How can you intentionally be following a path that leads to eternal damnation? We're looking for fellowship with God, 1 John. We want to be in fellowship with him. This is, this is really a smear against the Holy Spirit. We think about hum, uh, new hermeneutics. It is a smear against the Holy Spirit that Paul, that Paul argues for in that First Corinthian epistle. It is a determination not to do what's right. And it is not as though these people don't know what right is. I want to talk just briefly then about the, the dangers of substituting man's way for God's way. This has to do with the education issue. This has to do with the love letters. God loves everybody, and he loves everybody. But I want to think about Romans chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I think the names of some of these people were, were, were mentioned last night, but I also want to thank 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. But he says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discerning, discernment of discerning when I bring to naught. Where is the wise? The scribe, the dispute of this world. God, have not God made uh, foolish the wisdom of this world? And then, seeing that in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom knew not God. And I think that's a problem that we have with this uh, in education right now. And when I'm talking about education, I'm talking about education from the standpoint of what it's supposed to be, what some people call uh, church schools. And certainly the academic uh, accreditation concerns and issues that we find. These schools, many of them were originally, or more accurately, perhaps generally, guided by the principles of the Bible. But they have begun to peel away from the scriptures. And they have begun to pursue, they have become enamored by and to pursue the academic or the secular world. And I can't remember, I think it was Brother Mowry mentioned it yesterday, but this idea of scholarship. And in order for the world to see us uh, as assimilated, as a part of their world, we, had, we now have to bring in people who are not Christian. We have to bring in people who don't care about God, who are not interested in God, who are going to teach evolution. We have to bring these people in so that we will be seen by the academic world uh, as on their level. And they don't understand that we should already be above their level because we're trying to do what's right. <clears throat> well, we find this issue now, and especially uh, we've seen it from Pepperdine and Abilene. I, I don't even associate those schools any longer with the Church of Christ. I mean, they're really not. As a matter of fact, there are probably fewer than you can number on your hand that are actually sound. But anyway, <clears throat> when we look at this, this idea, uh, what these people are saying, Osborne, uh, down there in Abilene especially, what, what they're actually saying to people, in my view, is I can be a Christian and I can be stupid at the same time. And that's what they're saying. Now, that, that's really not true. It should not be true. But when people try to, and they publish books about uh, 
when when you at the at the end of life there is a, a short period of time where you might be persecuted and then your your soul is extinguished. Uh, it's not eternal punishment. When they, they look at these ideas of, of uh, the scriptures no longer being a uh, pattern and guide, a blueprint, but rather this is a love letter from God. He, he's not telling us what to do. He's telling us how much he loves us and gives us a, a, a lease to do whatever we please. Uh, all these sorts of assertions. These things are ridiculous. And when we see how some of those uh, who were in the brotherhood have, have gone on to uh, paved these paths. We've seen uh, Rubel Shelley, we've seen uh, Jeff Walling, and all of these people uh, who really no longer uh, should be associated with the name Church of Christ. And they just really should not. And, and we talk about them from time to time as, because we remember them. But those people are so far off in apostasy now, they're irretrievable. And we need to, we need to uh, not be so concerned about uh, what's on the outside, because we know we're going to have to face that. We need to, do, I guess as they say, hunker down to the core and realize that we're going to be smaller in number, perhaps. We're going to, be, we're going to have fewer and fewer uh, opportunities for fellowship, perhaps, because people, we're going to find fewer and fewer people really wanting to follow the truth and make the application of truth with regard to discipline. They're going to say, I'm just not willing, and, and the new hermeneutics is certainly uh, a part of that path. I'm just not willing any longer uh, to make any distinctions. And so we're going to be, and I live in the area where this word uh, really sort of drips off every lip, is that we're going to be tolerant. And, see, and, and in the Bay Area, the expectation is that you're tolerant of everything. Uh, anything that you can wildly imagine probably is at least normal there. So, no, I'm serious. And so when we look at, at this situation, and, and, and I wrote about one of these in um, our recent bulletin. It seems like every time I write a bulletin I get some sort of, get an email from somewhere. <laughs> Well, I wrote about this situation as one of these uh, church schools, and they're going to be taking a group of uh, students uh, pretty soon over to England. And they're taking these students over there, and the person who has their supervision, what he, what he said to the students, he says, now, we're not going to have our own worship service. And we're not going to look and find where you should go for worship service. Why don't you just go and run with it? Just go and go everywhere, wherever you please. And this is supposed to be a quote unquote as a church school, as they call it. And they're taking these students under their supervision who they are supposed to provide an example uh, and leadership. We're going to take these, these students over there. We're going to take them to England. And we're going to have them in a foreign country. Now, I know they speak the same language, but it's a foreign country. <laughs> I should have known. <laughs> we're going to take them over there, and we're going to, uh, we're not going to worship together where we know what's going to, you know, what's going to take place. We're going to give them the opportunity to just run with it. They said, and that was the exact quote, run with it. Now, they don't really care that much about, obviously, at least in my point of view, they don't really care that much about their spiritual welfare. But they are very concerned about their cultural experience. Now, how do I know that? Because they have arranged for all of them to be together at Westminster Abbey on Good Friday for a cultural experience. New hermeneutics. I am not anywhere near finished, but I know I'm going to have to be. <laughs> uh, David said something about Uzzah and, and how he learned his lesson the hard way. And I want to look over in First Chronicles chapter 13, verses 7 through 10. I'm not going to read all of that, uh, but also a, bit, a little bit later in, in chapter 15. 
They came into the threshing floor, and he put forth his hand to hold the ark, and the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against him, and smote him because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. Now, there are so many things wrong about that whole situation. He shouldn't even have been in that situation to begin with, but that was not the point. Uh, he, again, as the new hermeneutical people do, try to reinterpret something. He tried to figure out another way, and he was trying, he thought he was being helpful, and the new hermeneutical people think they're being helpful. They think that they're helping all these people coming to the Lord's fold. They think they're helping people to worship God with these praise teams. These children churches or children Bible those little things when they take the children out of the, the worship service and put them in a little place back there and take a few adults and put them back there with them and children churches, I think they call them. All these things. But in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, it says, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites, for them have God chosen to carry the ark. For that we sought him not after the due order. And there the explanation of why things went awry, because they didn't do it the way God told it was to be done. And I think that when we look at this in, in the larger sense of things, that's the idea. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, it says, hold the pattern. And I think that's what the expectation is for us, hold the pattern. And these people, we, we simply ask those questions. How is it possible to hold on to a pattern or preserve something which does not for them exist? They say there is no pattern. There is nothing to hold on to. There is nothing definite and determinate in the scriptures. It's just sort of an idea that's floating around out there and we just grab the parts of it that we want to use in the way that we want to incorporate new hermeneutics impossible to do those things to interpret the Bible so many different ways to make the application so many different ways to to undermine the scriptures in so many ways and think that there can be unity it's impossible and as we see with those examples that we used before and as we, we see with the examples that we used toward the end God has an expectation uh, as a commercial used to be out some years ago there's a higher standard and God holds us to that standard and that doesn't need to be newly hermeneuticalized. What we need to do is stay with it the way he gave it. Thank you. Johnny, thank you for that fine lesson. I believe everyone wants to conform their practice with their philosophy. So these new hermeneutics, hermeneuticals must uh, deconstruct truth and reconstruct it and to conform to the, what they either are practicing or want to practice. My speakers? I can't hear it. <laughs>